Hello and welcome to the new edition of Unipass Market Insights. My name is Florian Oberländer and on my side, the gentleman with the right answers, Mr. Gregor Pett, our chief analyst. Hello, Gregor. Hello, Florian. Mm -hmm. Gregor, uh, a lot of ground to cover today. I prepared a long list of, of questions. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we will run through, of course, development of commodities. We will take mm -hmm. a look mm -hmm. at uh, different shipping methods of LNG when it comes to transportation, mm -hmm. uh, Suez mm -hmm. Canal and Panama, just to, to name a few there. Uh, we also talk about the weather, what happened in the south of, of Germany and what the weather outlook will be for the next few months. But let's start with the recent announcement of the European Central Bank. What yes. exactly mm -hmm. happened there? Yeah, the European Central Bank increased the interest rate by 25 basis points and also reduced the deposit rate to 3.75%. Mm -hmm. And uh, this means, of course, I mean, the ECB is always in the uh, modus operandi of fighting inflation, mm -hmm. but at the same time not to basically reduce the economy too much. So it's clearly a balancing act. And it means that the ECB now for the first time after five years has chosen to reduce the interest rate, which means that they are reasonably confident that they uh, can uh, keep inflation at bay. Mm -hmm. However, they have not made any prediction on what they would go going forward. What this means is that they are looking at the data, the inflation data that has been gone up recently, yeah. but still the ECB remains confident that they can keep it at bay, but they've not uh, given any uh, clear outlook what they are going to do uh, next, yeah, which okay. is uh, probably reasonable. It also means that the uh, markets uh, have probably largely anticipated that already, mm -hmm. so I don't think it's, uh, it's a big surprise uh, what, what they've done. And, and what does it mean for the markets? What's the impact to, to us people as well? Is there any indication of that? Well, yeah. the, of course, the, the interest is then uh, to reduce inflation. So the cost of living for people also uh, doesn't go up that much. So And the inflation target is 2%. So that is, of course, very nice. But the current figures are still above that. So mm -hmm. which means then the, uh, the limit to reduce inflation rates further are probably limited now. Um, but at the same time, of course, a lower interest rate uh, stimulate the economy, which is another target. So okay. it's clearly a balancing act. And also the economy is uh, still rather weak in the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see how it reacts. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, I mean, we can report on it, um, you know, down the line yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, let's move to the commodity markets. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe quickly going through the commodities. Let's start with, with coal. That's on my list as well. You know, prices are on, on mm -hmm. higher levels compared to last year a mm. little bit, but slightly coming off now because it's just not the demand there right now to um, for heating. Uh, the cooling um, demand is not here in, the, in, mm. in Germany right mm. now. Any other uh, factors that we need to take a look at? Yeah, in Asia, of course, there's still a lot of coal burn. Mm. Uh, so in the, it's driven, as you said, by, by heating and cooling demand. So that's clearly a potential that keeps prices at a certain level. Mm. In Europe, uh, the demand is relatively low. Yeah, mm. So that is uh, because of the competition to gas when it comes to power generation, but also because of the coal phase out, as we, as we know. So also what recently has impacted it, the coal transport uh, with barges on the rivers mm. has been impacted by by high water levels. So yeah. it's uh, of then the barges can't sail and can't transport the coal. And the same happens, of course, when the water levels are too low. And that also yeah. reduces the offtake from coal to the power plants. But the, the in general, also the stocks at the power plants are relatively high, relatively solid. Yeah. So an overall very weak demand across Europe okay. for coal. But what a difference a year makes. I mean, last year we had the problem with low water levels and now we have too yeah. much, so, of course. Mm. Yeah, now check, our stocks are also on a decline a little bit, but on healthy levels for the summer. So mm -hmm. this shouldn't be yeah. a point of worry. Let's move to oil. You know, quite quite volatile price developments mm -hmm. there as well, but also on, on the higher level. Recently, a little bit downward trend that we could see. Uh, which led to the OPEC plus deciding mm -hmm. on, on what precisely? Well, they agreed uh, on cuts of 3.6 uh, million barrels a day until Q4 in 2025, mm -hmm. but also voluntary cuts for the shorter term for the next three months in the order of magnitude 2.2 million barrels a, a day. So um, uh, global demand is always so order of magnitude 100. Yeah, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that gives you an indication where that stands. What does it mean? I mean, clearly they are reacting to the prices. They want to stabilize these prices. That's the reason 
behind these measures, but it also reflects that different OPEC members have different cost situations. So some can afford more cuts yeah, and still be profitable. For others, it's, 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 it's tougher. So this is why they've been a little bit flexible. Yeah. Also, I think uh, no big surprise for the markets, these measures. Okay. Taken. Mm. All right. Um, moving to power, um, similar picture there as well. Uh, what have been the, the drivers for the power markets lately? The power markets in Europe uh, have been mainly uh, driven by fuels, so which means then, I mean, coal, but uh, largely gas. So, okay. of course, renewables, the weather patterns have, a, have an influence, and, uh, but that has been very volatile, but not, uh, not a, a clear trend, a long-term trend in one or the other uh, direction. Yeah. Uh, reminder, in Germany, we have like uh, more than 50% of renewable uh, production currently. Yeah. Then in the hours where the price is set by gas, so the gas prices mainly then drives also the power prices. Yeah. And we've seen power prices above 100 euro uh, recently then on the back of some rises in the gas markets uh, as well. So yeah. clearly a lot of factors coming together and making the power price uh, also volatile. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned it, uh, mm -hmm. the re renewable share in Germany, and that mm -hmm. leads me to a question that we received. Mm -hmm. Dear Gregor, Chancellor uh, Scholz recently said that he's confident that Germany will reach mm -hmm. a share of 80% renewable renewable energy by 2030. Mm -hmm. Is this realistic in your view? What do you think? Well, we have already yeah. above uh, 50 percent, so that's, uh, I, th I think that's not unrealistic that we get there, but we, we have, of course, to main the, uh, basically keep the effort going then to mm. go there. So which means permitting processes for, uh, for new renewables need to be fast track. And uh, so it's not a given that it happens by itself, but it's a reasonable chance that we get there. Okay. And y you mentioned it previously um, on power as well. It's it's important to have this this bridge technology, which is gas in that in that case as well. I mean, even if with eighty percent, there's still twenty yeah. percent, and uh, of course the ambition is to phase out uh, coal rather quickly, which means then gas is the only energy source that can yeah. balance that. We will not be able to build enough uh, batteries and and or hydrogen. Uh, storage then until 2030 to yeah. cover all of that. That will come later. Uh, so which means gas as the bridge technology is uh, and will remain important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then on that note, uh, some news that came in uh, recently as well, um, which said that uh, the use informal approval to subsidize the building of new gas fired generation. I think mm -hmm. they're talking about 10 gigawatts. Um, it's still in the, in the works, but um, the plants also need to run on green hydrogen. So uh, even on an EU level, you see that, mm. you know, this, this bridge technology is not ruled out at a certain point. It still needs to be there. Yeah, absolutely. So it's widely recognized and um, the, uh, the famous uh, power plant strategy, it, uh, it has seen some delays, as, as, you, as you mentioned, yeah. so, but we urgently need it. So yeah. we are waiting for that. Absolutely. Let's stay with, with gas, uh, you know, um, quite bullish developments, it's especially mm -hmm. this week. What was the reason behind it? The, the reason is some uh, extended outages uh, from uh, Norwegian production. Mm -hmm. So they had uh, to, um, to do some maintenance, which wasn't expected to, the, to that extent. And uh, that caused prices to, to rise well above 30 euros per megawatt hour yeah. um, on, the, on the TTF. And that shows how important uh, Norwegian production is. Uh, so Norwegian production amounts to uh, well around 30% uh, of current uh, gas consumption in Europe. Yeah. And it's clearly the, the single most important uh, source of, uh, of gas in Europe. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting th that you highlight this as well, because it's such an mm -hmm. important. And I think the movement showed as well that previously or previous years we had kind of a buffer, you know, with the reliance on Russian gas, mm -hmm. um, that this is not the case anymore. So this leads subsequently to stronger price developments in your view? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and not only Russian gas, but also uh, gas from the Netherlands, where the uh, production from the okay. fields in particular, the uh, Honingen field, uh, the biggest used to be the biggest gas field in Europe, is gradually phased out. Mm -hmm. So, which means uh, the reserve in the system, also to balance supply uh, outages, is is becoming more and more limited. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then we as Unipar, and then to you out there, I can just recommend you that you look this yeah. up. Also release the press release yeah. that we have finally terminated all of the Russian gas supply contracts. And that uh, can be found on our website under the, the news section. So go and check this out as well. Coming back to, to the gas subject, um, in general, fundamentally, uh, Germany at 73% of uh, storage mm -hmm. levels. Uh, I think the rest of the EU looks also very healthy. One thing that was a little bit more on the bullish side was the LNG, so the liquefied natural gas. Um, 
what was mm. the reason behind that? So that was the case uh, recently when we saw uh, some outages from the US, which is now uh, being fixed. So the uh, Freeport terminal that had uh, these problems, mm. it's now producing very stable. So that, that is good. But also we've seen uh, increased demand in Asia. So uh, the LNG cargoes now, if, if you compare it to um, to last year, are going more uh, into Asia than uh, than into Europe right now, so mm. that, which is a reflection of the relative demand uh, also in these uh, in these regions. Yeah, so similar to core situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. We previously talked about it um, as well, the Suez uh, Canal. We haven't seen any cargoes heading through that way. Is that influencing what we receive mm. in in Europe? Well, uh, indirectly, yes. Uh, so as you said, since uh, January, I think uh, we haven't seen anything coming uh, through there regarding LNG, which means the cargo is going uh, uh, the Cape route uh, yeah. then. And uh, that is delaying things. But with the current supply demand balance, that's not a major problem. However, of course, it makes the system a little bit tighter. So then uh, basically, so it's less efficient yeah, so the, because the routes are slightly longer, yeah. which means in case of interruptions or in case of additional things happen, uh, the effect would, uh, would then be higher. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I think previously we saw around 35 cargoes a month going uh, each way, mm -hmm. uh, Suez Canal. Uh, and now we see also with the, the problems at the Can uh, Panama Canal, mm -hmm. which we'll discuss in a second, uh, we will see around um, 70 to 80 cargoes going the, the mm -hmm. Hope route, which is um, you know three, uh, three times higher than last year, so quite a significant number. That's uh, indeed significant, but uh, it's not causing interruptions, supply interruptions at, yeah. as we speak, yeah. but it of course reduces the, uh, sa if you want, the safety margin yeah. in the system then for for supplier demand uh, interruptions. Yeah. What I found mm. interesting as well is that when, when the US is taking the route to Asia mm -hmm. um, via the Atlantic, that you know they prefer the, the option uh, sometimes to go via Suez because then they have, they have the option to sell the cargoes to Europe as well. If they go the Cape route, that is limited a little bit there. Um, but then of course, yeah. India, mm -hmm. India open up as a potential buyer as well. Yeah, uh, interesting to see. I think right now we're getting around 10 to 11 cargoes a month. Uh, to Europe, um, but that uh, was a little bit higher uh, previously. So um, I think mm -hmm. we will see what the Asian development there as well. Yeah, but also we have, as, as you previously said, we have high storage levels, so yeah. we don't need uh, that much as we as we speak. So we can can fill storage as, uh, uh, in, uh, and that was was different in previous years. So yeah. that's uh, there's also that reason why it, it doesn't come into Europe. I'm sure we will discuss this topic again, heading more yeah, into, into uh, winter. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> indeed, yeah. Good deal. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned it. Um, Suez Canal has some, some issues right now. Um, similar things mm -hmm. we will see in Panama, different mm -hmm. reasons behind mm -hmm. it. But the Panama Canal is an important mm -hmm. transportation route um, for um, US LNG to Asia, for example. Mm -hmm. And due to a drier situation in that area, um, which didn't have that much rain, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Gatun Lake, which is like in the middle of the Panama Canal and uh, providing water, very low levels, which leads to Panama uh, Canal having issues getting mm -hmm. the, the ships mm -hmm. across. Has that influenced any of the transportation routes for US LNG? C currently, not uh, not so significantly, because uh, they also can uh, take the Cape route in this case, or basically go uh, go east as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, they have these uh, possibilities. They sometimes prefer if they want to go to Japan or Korea, uh, the the Panama Canal, because mm -hmm. that's clearly that saving saving time to go there. Yeah. But it's not per se causing such a big problem. Transport routes become longer, which again uh, makes the system less efficient and uh, reduces the ability to react. Yeah, but uh, but it's not at the current supply demand situation, not a big problem in itself. Okay, yeah, but you see, it's adding up. Yeah, so it's it's there's it's here and there. Exactly. And at some point, uh, if it adds up, can, it can result in a problem. Yeah. I mean, we have specialists that observing the routes, and uh, what I find really interesting as well. Mm -hmm. If when a ship leaves a harbor and has a destination, sometimes it changes, you know, two to three times or something, depending on where Absolutely. it was sold yeah. to. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. Yeah, you look at so the price constellations well. and then you make these decisions. Yeah. Uh, sometimes even reloading, which means then you uh, load onto another vessel uh, in the port of destination and yeah. then it gets transported elsewhere. All these optimization possibilities exist. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly.
good deal. Yeah, and I did some research on the Panama Canal as well, and, and to you out there, I can just recommend doing some mm -hmm. research there as well. 26 meters are the different mm -hmm. water levels from sea level to the Gatun Lake, and uh, it's yeah, amazing how they elevate yeah. mm -hmm. it. So. Mm -hmm. um, but we see um, our weather specialist forecast a little bit more rain in that area, so that is you know, subject to change a little bit there mm -hmm. again. Um, something that we have seen, uh, unfortunately, a lot of in, mm -hmm. in the south mm -hmm. of Germany as well, the flooding. Can you maybe explain a little bit how this weather situation forms in the first place? Yeah, that's uh, due to a low pressure system, which uh, usually is around the Alps, Gulf of Genova in the, in the Mediterranean. And, and that has led uh, in, in the current situation to increased rainfall. Um, uh, of the first uh, of uh, the uh, the feeders, if you want, to the mm -hmm. big rivers, and then eventually to the big rivers uh, being affected by that, uh, the the feeding smaller uh, rivers and have have have, have then led uh, to the big rivers like uh, the Rhine and particularly the Danube, mm -hmm. then to uh, to uh, to swell and then to to the resulting flooding, uh, which yeah. is. Uh, because of the, the, this system remained uh, longer than usual, and uh, this led to the situation to the pro prolonged rainfalls. Yeah, and is it expected to happen again? Soon? It can happen again. So it's not it's not a um, it's not a given. Yeah, but uh, the current constellation shows that it could happen again o yeah. over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and I mean, despite the of course devastating situation for the people on site. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it also has an, an influence on the energy markets, like you mentioned, the, the mm -hmm. transportation routes um, as well there. Yeah, the transportation routes, uh, barges in particular on the rivers, yeah. but also the, the hydro production is affected because, I mean, more water doesn't mean necessarily more hydro production. Yeah. It can reach a level where you uh, c cannot safely produce, but also then... Uh, uh, like gas or coal-fired plants that are close to rivers, of course, need yeah. to be protected from the flooding, uh, so they can still pr produce. Uh, yeah. and, and that includes also groundwater levels that uh, may, may raise. Uh, all of this comes together, yeah. so it's clearly has an impact on, 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 on energy as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we had the issue with our Irshing uh, yes. gas-fired mm -hmm. plant mm -hmm. for Unipi as well there, and uh, yeah, fingers mm -hmm. crossed for for the people that have to to deal with that situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Will it stay like that this summer, the weather, or are so we facing something else? Currently, current predictions are slightly uh, colder than uh, normal uh, mm -hmm. weather. And uh, uh, solar also basically not, not really uh, above uh, average and, but, uh, and also not wind. So it's, it looks slightly colder than, than usual, but let's see. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it's always far, far ahead um, to, to predict that, um, however. Clearly every seasonal prediction has, uh, has some uncertainties, That's, uh, that has to be said. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, and hopefully maybe we get a nice, nice fall, fingers crossed. <laughs> Gregor, that was already my, my mm -hmm. long list. Um, thank you very much again for yeah, answering all of the questions. Mm -hmm. And um, to you out there, thank you uh, for watching. Um, at this point, I think we have to mention as well that, you know, Market Insights, it's not only Gregor Pett and Florian Oberländer, there are a lot of people um, behind the scenes that prepare, you know, numbers mm -hmm. for us that help with the production. So a special thank you to all of you people as well. Mm -hmm. And to our audience, uh, it would be great if you could like um, this video or the podcast and also share it with your family and friends. Uh, or maybe your colleagues and um, yeah if you have any questions just post them we will try to get it answered here as well see you next time until then bye bye